Last night I had dreams That somebody loved me No hope, no harm Just another false alarm Last night I felt Real arms around me No hope, no harm Just another false alarm So tell me how long
I felt betrayed by Britney. You know how all her songs and videos were about that journey from girl to woman? Yeah. And it sort of felt good, didn't it? I remember having my first period and it's to I'm not girl. But when I saw the video to hit me baby one more time, all that stuff with the tongue flicking and the crop top, did she have a belly button pierced back then? Probably. Oh, sorry, go on. Well, I got really angry. It's no longer Brittany talking to us, but some pervert record producer. He's got this vision, this plan of turning every eight-year-old in the Western world into a tongue-flicking, crop-topped, belly-button-pierced temptress. Have you got your belly button pierced? Well, yeah, of course. Did it hurt? It's not as bad as you hear. And there's this bloke. He lives in this, in this big gap in the middle of town. He lives with dwarves. Nothing wrong with that. Fair whack. But they're orange. Well, there's orange dwarves with green hair. Well, there's only around 20 of them making the world's supplied chocolate. None of it is meant to be realistic. Why make them dwarves in the first place? What's wrong with the ordinary? You don't mind listening to this. <laughs> That's what the room's all about. If you have a problem, just get it out. Well, well maybe I, I shouldn't even be in this place. I, I don't know if it's that serious yet. It, it doesn't matter. There isn't a scale of depression here. I'm here at the other end and I'm here to listen to you, Jim. Right. Um, don't, don't be nervous. Well, I'll start then. Okay. Britney Spears, you sold my childhood soul, and now I'd smack her in the face. And what would Britney say? Hit me, baby, one more time. Nice one. Her day of judgment will come when some kid will stop her outside Prada and say, you sold my childhood soul, bitch. Um, I'd better go. It's been nice talking to you, whoever you are. Oh, can we not just talk for a little bit more? I just had an argument with my bitch mother and I'm feeling terrible. What would you want to talk about? Murder. My mother's very active in the church. She's the Virgin Mary. Is it? Did it make you Jesus Christ? In the Passion, she's Mary. Right? And every year my whole family get involved. I've got 300 brothers and they're very big and they're Roman soldiers. Not like me. Well, anyway. This year, my mother comes into my bedroom with her good news. She's moving up like she's going to tell me I'm getting a stab at playing a centurion or, or something. That is until she tells me. They want me to play John. Well, John's a great part. Yeah, but he's a bit gay. How do you mean? Well, I've got nothing against gay people. Uh, St. John was gay. Uh, Historically speaking, probably not. But in our parish, it's always the slightly effeminate boys you get to play from. Okay. Like I said, I've got nothing against gay people. I respect them. They're tough. They stand up. They know their own mind, you know? Well, we do a few rehearsals with my mother as the Virgin Mary, and I've, I've got to get all emotional when Jesus is dying on the cross, but. I'm getting very nervous because basically I'm a terrible actor and I'm getting all blocked up. Emotionally? Well, exactly. Right? So, I tell my mother I want to drop out and I say it quietly so the others can't hear me, but she just starts shouting at me and saying how typical it was and did I have a backbone and why was I such a coward and why wasn't I like my older brothers and, and all this shit. And then she said, I'm not my dad. Well, what would I know? I haven't seen my dad since I was six. But, but she just starts shouting, you're just like your dad, Jim. You're just like your dad, walking out on things, walking out on me, gutless. I mean, I hated her just then. So, so the following night is the passion proper, and I'm kneeling, looking up at Jesus. He's doing a great job dying on the cross. Understand? Right, right. Woman, behold your son. And at the start, I didn't know whether it was his great delivery or just me thinking about my mother 
being my mother, but I started to cry. I'm, I'm crying really hard. I completely upstaged Barry's crucifixion, and the night is suddenly about St. John. And if he's going to be alright, and if he's going to have the strength to, to start and finish his gospel. Anyway, afterwards, and my mum's having a lemonade in the sacristy at the back of the church, and I'm looking over at her. And I realised why well, I was crying back then. I was crying because I know my mother doesn't like me. But where do I go? Jesus! You know, in the real world, it would have been the fat German kid who falls in the chocolate lake at the beginning of the tour. In the real world, he's a winner. This is how it ends, right? He falls in. He gets his dad to get these big-time lawyers to sue the shit out of Willy Wonka. They look into his dodgy personal life with those orange pigeons. That's a real world. We don't use our real names. And we don't see what schools we're from. We know we're from the same city. And that's enough to tie us all together. It keeps it impersonal. I'll use William. I'll be Eva. Emily. How do we know you're not some middle-aged man trying to get off chatting up two teenage girls? How do I know you're not two frustrated housewives trying to take advantage of an innocent altar boy? <laughs> yeah, because all people can be placed in little boxes like that. They can. Oh, so what are you then? I'm a pain in the arse. Oh, I'm a cynic. An angry cynic. Very attractive. I'm not interested in being attractive. Why should I be? I'm a gay tribe when we're supposed to make a stand for something. To me, it's not about going bowling and making friends and sitting at McDonald's bumming for cigarettes. Apart from the pumps, what have teenagers done in the last 30 years? Nothing. My mother was a pump. Um, we've got this photograph of her from 1976 and she got a cold sore on her face size of a tennis ball. <laughs> would you ever... Would you ever really kill anything? The rule in the room is we don't give advice, we just listen. So what about you? Do you have anything you want to share? No, I just listen. What, no problems? I prefer to listen to other people's. But what do you get out of that? Does knowing that there's other people suffering make you feel better about your own problems? No. Have you been to many suicide rooms? Yes. And do they help? <laughs> you said I needed to be helped. Well, can I know your name? You can call me Laura. But, but, but is that your real name? Maybe. Any idiot can kill someone. What's the glory in that? Well, aren't you meant to say, you know, that each life is sacred? Well, that's crap. There are some people who life's just wasted on them. Terrorists, racists, dictators. PE teachers. They don't do anything. Just suck all the goodness out of it. I think William just wants to make a big statement. Exactly. Who doesn't? I do. It's Eva. Is there anyone there? Are the people still awake? We don't use our real names. Any details. Right. I'll be Jim. Yeah. Hello, Jim. I'm Eva. Emily. I'm William. So what happens here then? What goes on? Hey, discussion! Chit chat! Bullshit! <laughs> You got problems, Jim. Yeah. Are they big problems? <laughs> <laughs> I think so. Looks up to me, anyway. And and you want us to, to give you some advice? <laughs> you still there, Jim? Yes. We're here to help you.
being bullied all the way through primary school and now in secondary school. But I have bigger worries, deeper worries that I can't really explain. And it's tricky. And recently I've started to feel like, what's the point? What's the point in everything? But, but not in a moaning, teenage way. So your depression isn't put off? No, way. Oh, it feels great! What do you think? No, I know it's crap. I just want to know what it feels like to Jim. Well, Jim? It's, it's like a world has turned into soup. Everything has the consistency of soup. And your insides and your heart, well, they, they just sort of ache. And it's like you're clogged up with five sliced pounds of bread. It's exactly like that. Depression's like bread and soup. Oh, shut up! I, I was only repeating. Well, the, the food comparison probably doesn't work. Schizophrenics often say they feel like a mixed salad. <laughs> you sound sweet. Do, do you have a girlfriend? Hold on a sec. We're here to give Jim some advice. Well, I did have a, a girlfriend, but I don't know anymore. I just wanted to know if you had anyone close to you. You don't have anyone in your family to talk to, so I, I, I thought maybe an understanding girlfriend would help you too. Jesus, Emily. If you'd been listening to Jim for the last hour, you wouldn't ask that. Jim doesn't have our normal teenage problems. It's not something that can be solved by a quick feel like that side of the chip shop. He's different. I mean, of course, he would have a girlfriend, but that can't happen, because he's just dealing with getting up in the morning and facing into another one of his shitty days. Oh, uh, not that bad. Maybe. Think before you speak, Emily. Piss off. No. It's just bullshit. I expected more from you. I didn't have you down as some head in the sand princess. I'm not like that. Selfish cow. Jesus, all I said was... Jim has a car she's coming to this room and open up to us about all of his pathetic crap. All you're asked to do is imagine that someone else could possibly be a little bit different from you. You have no idea why I'm not. Well, by a comment like that, that Jim could be cured by the heart of a good girl. I, I didn't mean... Sorry about all this, Jim. No, really. I think we've all got a pretty good impression of the type of girl you are, Emily. What's the worst that's happened to you, eh? Scuffed your chinos in the park. That night, Daddy didn't pick you up from Pizza Hut and you had to take the bus home. Or maybe when your pony had to be put down because your big, fat, preppy ass was buckling its back. I had a Rexy no, so what? We came down on Rexia, was it? Busting up those chinos and you just had to lose a few pounds. Anorexia is a status symbol for your type of girl. You wear your six months anorexia like a badge of honour. Or you think it gives you an edge? It makes you a cliché. We want people who are here for Jim. I am here for Jim. Someone who understands his problem. Who gets the cause. Well, what cause? What, Jim is your cause now? We're here 100% on 24 hour call. <laughs> if Jim's really cut up over something, we're here to listen to and advise him. Understood? That's right. We don't need any chaff. We don't need some ex-anorexic pony rider whining little TV Digest soundbites. Put simply, piss off. That, that was all a bit weird. Well, you don't have to worry about that now. Well, okay. So. Tell me about the day your father went missing. Well, it's sort of important. Shouldn't I wait for William to get there? Oh, I'll get him my notes. Oh, right. Well, I'm six years old and my three brothers are going away with my mother for the weekend. My dad's staying to look after me. So they're gone and me and my dad are sat at the kitchen table looking at each other. It's like we're looking at each other for the first time, you know? He asked me what I want to do, and straight away I say I want to go and see the penguins at the zoo. When I was six, I was going through some mad penguin obsession. 
I used to dress up as a penguin at dinner sometimes. But if it wasn't penguins, it was cowboys. <laughs> I mean, cowboys were cool. Oh, God. Right. Well, we get to the zoo and I wear my cowboy outfit. We get the bus and it's sort of funny to see my dad on the bus, away from the house. Anyway, we get to the zoo and I head straight for the penguins, standing there in my cowboy outfit, looking at the penguins, having had such a great chat to my dad on the bus. It was a perfect childhood day. He lets go of my hand and says he'll be back with my chocolate ice. And he goes. He's gone. It's an hour since he's left and I'm not worried yet. I go to the bus stop we got off at earlier. I tell the driver my address and he asks where my parents are. I say they're at home waiting for me. I get the key from, from under the mat and go inside and, and I'm alone there. And I suppose I still think my dad will be come back in a minute so I take off my cowboy gear and have a bath and get into my pyjamas because my dad would have liked that. I have some milk and some biscuits and watch stars in their eyes because that was his favourite programme. It's getting dark outside and I start to worry. The house is feeling too big so I get my quilt and I take it into the bathroom with me. And I lock the door and it feels safer with the door lock so I just stay in there. And he's not coming back. He's never coming back. I stay in there for two days. <laughs> Stay indoors, but being the youngest brother to Brothers Bill on the rugby field, they adopt you as their plaything. And later, they're punch back. So, at the age of five, you go back outside to play with your children. <gasps> Only to find that bonds of friendship have already been formed. And there's little room for a tubby toddler with an unhealthy obsession with penguins. <laughs> You're alone, but you do find a friend in, oh, Timmy. Little Timmy Timmons. A tiny six-year-old with severe bronchial problems has to drag a small oxygen canister behind him. One momentous day, your father leaves you at the zoo, leaving the family in the sheets. Your mother is forced into finding her very first job, or she finds work in a petrol station, ending her dreams of the posh life and sending her into a depression eased only by... Gin and tonic, the tonic beer. Valium. Your best friend, Timmy, dies. The day of Timmy's funeral, you take your first valium. You are aged eight. Eight and a half. Eight and a half. You try to make contact with your dad by placing leaflets up on lampposts. But to no avail. Well, you try to make friends with anyone you meet by ingratiating yourself to whatever they want you to be. But to no avail. At the age of 13, you read your first porn which only creates more of a distance between you and those girls you will never get to touch. You hate yourself and decide to stop communicating with the outside world entirely. Your life's directionless. The next two years is a sad cocktail of homemade beer, the odd Valium, the odd shot of whiskey. Nights begin to take on a pattern of aggressive self-analysis and blame. Until one night, you're speaking to an American bloke on the internet who's planning to kill himself. You reach a moment of recognition. You are searching for a purpose. A purpose? Fifteen years. It's depressing and a little embarrassing. 
If it wasn't such a tragic life, it would be a very funny story. I don't reckon you've ever been given a chance. For some reason, you're always the one who gets bad. Well, why me? You can't take responsibility for what other people have done to you, or what they think of you, Jim. The reasons why people have done those things to you isn't something you have control over. Why me? It's a pointless question. Stupid, even. Right. Sorry. What you're feeling right now, that's what's important. Concentrate on that. You've got to focus your anger and channel it into something that's going to get those bastards back. What do you mean? Well, how do you think you would hurt your mother for all those years of neglect? All those years she treated you like nothing. Well, I've been fighting her for so long now. But she doesn't listen, does she? No. And it doesn't make me feel any better. So? I've been thinking about if she came into my room one morning and then I'd done something. I can see the look on her face. Bitch. The guilt would kill her. Yeah. Yeah, it would. But, but I don't know if I'm ready to, to do that. Jim. Yeah. We've been giving up our time and listening to you these past few nights, haven't we? Yeah, yeah, and, and thanks, guys, really. Well, I just want you to do one thing for me, all right? Yeah, sure, will you? I want you to ask yourself two questions before you go to bed tonight. Have you got a pen to them down? Uh, yeah, 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 go on. Why is it that people treat me like I'm nothing? If no one cares about my life, why should I care? It's, it's two o'clock in the morning and my mother's outside hoovering the stairs and landing. Tonight, my three idiot brothers call me a freak for not wanting brown sauce on my chips. I'd better go. Thanks, guys. Sweet dream. <laughs> He's ours. The rule in the room is we don't give advice. He spoke about you. About this place and what he might listen to you. If he's suicidal, the last thing he needs is someone else giving their half assed opinions. It doesn't help. Believe me. Well, it's not like that. <laughs> he's been taught into doing something. I can't get involved. Yeah. 
Yeah, I suppose. Well, it sort of seems right that he remains alone. That people see him die like that. Well, it's stronger, isn't it? Oh, definitely. Well, I'm usually alone anyway, so... And lately, I, I don't like being out in public so much, so... It seems easier if I do it here. Can you get a little webcam to broadcast it? My brother Derek has one. Perfect! Of course, he, he'd kill me if he found me using it. Well, we wouldn't want that to happen now, would we? It sort of steals your thunder. <laughs> before we know each other. You're a friend of his. Why exactly are you housing him like this? We're here for Jim. Do you know what sort of state he's in? I know he hasn't been feeling well. What? He hasn't been feeling good about himself. He's lonely. He feels attacked. He's suicidal. He's ready to take his life. That's what you want. Why is it that you're doing this? We're his friends. No, you're not. Oh, we didn't abandon him like you. He came to us looking for advice and we'd be making things clear for him. Are you serious? Oh, why don't you just piss off? You're making him believe that there's no options. You're making him believe that suicide is some romantic gesture. Like one 15-year-old's death will be held up by other 15-year-olds and celebrated for something. We'll make a statement for all those trapped average teenagers. Trapped by who? Trapped in what? Trapped by adults. So then we're faceless. It's not about what... Other people think about you. We're yeah, powerless. The power is knowing what you are. What you want to be. If you think of yourself as some blob that's moulded into this empty child and sent on a set pattern through life, if you think that, then it will happen. It will happen. Choices are made and choices will be made in your life. Well, you don't have control. Your path is set. That's shit. Every single moment in life, there's possibilities. Bitch! The statement being made is yours. But what are you saying, William? That you've got power. That you're smart enough to take advantage of someone vulnerable and talk them into a corner where they might kill themselves. And this is some joke to you two, right? Some big comedy. Because you can't see him, it's easier. It's easier because you don't have to see a dead boy and just imagine it like you read it in a book or something. It's easier than murder because Jim's faceless to you. But it's just like murder. In these rooms, words are power and you and that bitch have all the right words, haven't you? You tried to kill yourself, but you chickened out, didn't you? Oh, shut up! You think I'm going to allow Jim to be lectured by some whinging coward like you? Jim has real problems. This isn't some competition about who's the most sad here. And if you need to know, you dick, I have tried to kill myself. I did slip my wrists. It did come from a very real place. I'm happy I'm alive. And some days are better than others, and the future scares me, but I'm ready for the struggle. <laughs> I like the struggle. I like it a lot more than being dead and stuck in the ground and watching over my family and friends who I've ripped apart. Stay alive and they can help me. There's always possibilities. There's always a life. You're one of those sad girls who hangs around in suicide chapels, wallowing in other people's pain. Well, what sort of a statement is it that you're making, bitch? You talk about a life of choices, love, possibilities and happiness. But I bet that you would like nothing more than a world of sad, morose 15-year-olds droning on about their pathetic lives. Well, why not support those who want to kill themselves? Why not allow them to do it? Give them the help they need to do the brave thing. Do the decent thing. To get rid of the chat and make way for a true revolutionary teenager. 
So do the decent thing. You worthless cow. Next time, don't cry out to mummy and daddy. Just do it, son! Five of us are from the same city. Tomorrow at one o'clock, I want you to be at McDonald's in Winthorpe Street. I want you to be there because I can't be in my bedroom anymore. Maybe I'll go quietly, but I want you to see me do it. Well, you will be there then. I'm still here to talk to you. You know, I don't think I can listen to me talk about myself anymore. I only have a few words left I want to say now, Laura. Don't. Let's finish this. teenagers who kill themselves every year. Somebody would be killing themselves right now, maybe. While a number of others would have it all planned out, and, and a lot of them are doing it because they really are very sick. While others are doing it because they're alone. Or maybe, maybe they're sad because someone hurt them somehow. There are so many reasons to do it, and I started to think, about all the friends and families that are left behind and the regret which must eat them up. It's all so quiet and environment. I got off the bus and walked through the city and I started to imagine all the ghosts of the dead teenagers looking at me. It's like they follow me right down Winthorpe Street and into McDonald's and they see me buy some nuggets and a coat and find a table and they see me getting out my camera. In this room, those angels waiting for me. And, and I don't see myself as anything other than me. I, I don't imagine what I'm about to do is making some big statement or speaking out for millions of teenagers. I'm alone. I take out the camera and give it to this little 10-year-old boy and I tell him to point it up at me in the table. Probably like thousands of teenagers who get depressed. It's almost enough for me to know that someone is there and someone is listening, but I had to do something for me. I had to grow up fast when my father left, and it's as simple as that. And, and I really miss him, and I, I can't understand why he's gone. Something that simple can mess you up for such a long time. 
When you're six and standing in a zoo, looking at penguins, dressed in a cowboy outfit, you shouldn't be made to grow up so fast. But I was. And I've torn myself up over it for years, just trying to find an answer, but honestly, what can a child do? I want my childhood back. So, so this is the place where the smart talking stops. It's, it's just something for me now. It's something for those angels to smile at. Maybe. Bunny rabbits. <laughs>